If you would like to use the Pew Bible, the, the scripture is on page 847, and that's Mark 11. And we will begin uh, with verse 22 and till the end of the chapter. And Jesus answered, saying to them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. Therefore, I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they will be granted you. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. They came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him and began saying to him, By what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do these things? And Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question, and you answer me, and then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John f from heaven or f from man? Answer me. They began reasoning among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, then why do you not believe him? But shall we say from man, they will pray to the people? For everyone considered John to have been a real prophet. Answering Jesus, they said, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Nor will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Thank you, Ed. If you don't know Ed, Ed is our elder that does a lot around here, and he is also the elder that looked to as our prayer ministry uh, continues on. We have prayer meeting on Wednesday, and we've made a change with it, and that is this. It goes from 6.30 to 7. We read some verses, and then we start praying. There's no Bible study. We get right to prayer. And in future bulletins, and I will get an email out and a Facebook out concerning Ed's phone number. If you have something that you want someone to pray about, you can text him. He does not text back, all right? <laughs> but you can text him, and he will pray for that and um, bring that. If you'd like it brought to prayer meeting, we'd love to invite you to be a part of that ministry and our numbers we want them to grow as a church family if you are praying at home god bless you i know that that's going on if you're praying in your grace group god bless you i know many of you have 
responsibilities on Wednesday. Many times getting back to church on a Wednesday is difficult. But if there's times where you're like, you know what, I, I think I need to get to prayer. You are more than welcome. And we start at 6.30 and we end at 7. And I just want to invite you uh, to be a part of that ministry. Let's pray again. Father, we can't talk to you enough. Uh, your son modeled it when his disciples were with him. They saw him as a person of prayer, and so they went to him and asked, said, teach us to pray. They, they pleaded with him, and then he gave them a model prayer for themselves. And we ask you, God, that we would be people that would call out to you. And so in this section of Scripture, when prayer is talked about, I'd ask you, Father, that you would be the teacher on this, that you would uh, grab a hold of our hearts and give us an understanding of why is this so important to you. Um, you're all knowing. You know what's best. You do what's best. Why talking to you about these things is important? Well, you told us to do it. And so we're asking, Father, that you would help us this morning as we once again look into your word. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you have your Bible open if you don't have a, a book or you have your tablet open or your phone or whatever. But to look at the scriptures and there's a section in your bulletin, bulletin, you pull that out and write some notes down. And I kind of want to get you started by thinking about this. And this isn't in your notes, but you can write these questions um, and just chew on this a little bit, but I'd like to ask you, do you want to know truth? Do you want to know the truth about stuff, about life, about things, about God? Do you really want to know truth? There is, in theological circles, it's, it's had somewhat of a, a rise and it's kind of going down now, but it, it takes forms in other ways, but I've heard this over the last few years, these kind of things. And they'll, they'll talk about truth, and they'll say things like this, that's your truth. Okay, you'll see that. And I want you to be listening. When people talk, I know you're like, well, of course you should listen to when people talk, okay? But there's times words mean things. And so when people say certain things, ask the Lord to give you wisdom on to, to, to discern what they mean when they're saying what we do want to understand people we want to understand and really what's the story behind the story why they may be asking the things they're doing why they're saying the stuff they say why why these things are important to them and so when you hear somebody say that's your truth there's something to that now, you could say, but there, isn't that true? There's sometimes where somebody has this thing that they believe that's true about themselves, or true, and so it's their truth. It could be. But sometimes what that is is you have your truth, and I have my truth, and we're both not necessarily right, or we're both not necessarily wrong. It's just what that works for you, and this works for me, and so that's your truth. Do you see how that could be dangerous? Do you see how that could create a problem? Because what if my truth isn't true? I could feel like it is. I could want to believe it's the truth. And so there are certain terms that would be used. There would be terms like this, talking about the Christian life. I'm on a journey. And there's even a church I know that Josh Duran has been at called Journey. And I love the name because obviously we're all on a journey in this life. We're on a journey. But we're working toward a destination, aren't we? Aren't, isn't there some place that we're heading? And every now and then we got to a place like when I'm, when I'm walking up these steps, I don't want to be having my foot hovering over that. St I'm really balanced, you can tell. Um, I've only had a little NyQuil. To, no, I didn't have any. Um, but at some point, I've got to put my, put my foot down on that step because I'm heading toward up here. But there seems to be almost a pride in the fact that I'm still working things out. I'm finding myself. I'm trying to figure this out. I'm on a journey as opposed to I'm actually I got on a step here. And guess what? I'm working toward, and I got another one. And then I'm getting here. And ultimately, I get up here, and you're like, thank you, you're up there, all right? I could speak to you from down there, but you know what my point is? You're getting somewhere. 
Even Pilgrim's Progress, which, which, is, which, which was a journey, Pilgrim got somewhere. There seems to be a subtle pride, but it comes across as humble when I, you know, I still don't have it all figured out. And they're living in this morass and they're just like, and that's your truth and this is my truth. Instead of going, are there some things that we could know? Like a first question I want to ask you, is God knowable? Okay, but, but you'll hear phrases like, there's mystery. And you'll even say it like Doug Henning as a magician, mystery. And you're like, I don't know if you remember Doug Henning. I'm, I date myself constantly with you guys. He was on Johnny Carson. Johnny Carson was this guy. No. Um, and, but there's this, this idea that if I, I just, I don't know God and, and I'm trying to get to know God. And obviously in God's fullness, that's what even glory is going to be about. We're going to just keep finding out things about God. We're going to be like, you're like amazing. And for eternity, we're going to be able to just bask in this amazing person. But what he wants for us to know about him, he's not playing games. He actually wants us to know about those things about him. Like for, uh, I love how this one author writes about this. He says, I can't love my wife without knowing facts about her. Occasionally, my love for her is just love of love or worse Love for the sake of being loved. Unless I love her for the facts of who she is, what she has done, and what she does, I am loving a shapeless, formless void. No matter how much I rightly stress the importance of relationship with my wife beyond mere knowledge about her, I must have knowledge about her in order to have a relationship. After all, if I don't know any of the abstract and impersonal facts about my wife, like her hairstyle, eye color, height, etc. How can I have a personal relationship with her? I won't even be able to pick her out of a crowd. It matters little how glowingly I speak about our relationship if I cannot make clear, certain, unequivocal statements about my wife. How good is our relationship really? Prattling on about the wonders of personal relationship while refusing to make definite statements about the one we love in the relationship is not the kind of talk that honors my wife or God, for that matter. And so there will be people that will say, uh, yeah, I don't know if you can know God completely. Well, obviously we can't know him completely. Someday we will. But there are things that he's made us aware of us. In fact, he says this in Acts 17, verse 23. Acts 17, he said, for, and this is uh, Paul wa- working through Athens, and he saw all of these idols, and it kind of grieved his heart, and, and he stops, and he says, For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. So Paul had a firm, concrete belief, I can tell you, oh God. He, I, I know him, and I'm introducing you to him. And it's in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, some of you might be going, are there really people out there? I'm telling you, there are. And it sounds noble. There, there's also this question of, is uncertainty the same as humility? There's this, I don't know, oh, shucks, I don't know. And it comes across, but at some point, even people that say you can't know God and you can't, be certain about certain things, they will land somewhere on something. They will say, yeah, who are you to tell me all those things about God? But ultimately they've got their things that they believe that they will bring out and say, but this is true. Now they won't necessarily say it in those words, but they stand on something. Even if it's nothing, that's their theology, a theology of nothingness. And I'm here to tell you that God can be known, and that's why we look in his word. That's why we're doing this thing called church. Because we, we know of him. We're getting to know more about him, but he can be known. And it's truth. And it's not just my truth to make me feel good about God. Remember when this, these things have been happening in our country lately, and there's been people pushing back on you know, our thoughts and prayers after this kind of event that happened this past Wednesday, our thoughts and prayers, and that's not enough. 
This, 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 this thoughts and prayers thing, that, uh, thoughts only mean so much, but prayers is pretty good stuff, all right? But I'm praying to somebody that's real. It's not just to make myself feel better. I got, the, got this thing out there that I talk to. He's a person that cares. Last question to think about. Is doubt the essence of faith? That's another thing, talking about doubt. And it's lifted up as, oh, that person doubts. They're incredible. I'm not kidding. These are things that come up and the mystery and all stuff. And, and they'll say these things about, they'll lift doubt up as this, this thing. And it's like Thomas was the greatest of all disciples because he doubted. Here's why I think God has Thomas in the story. It's because we're like that. Doubt is real. But he never commends doubt. It's never to the point of, you doubt, you're amazing. You guys that really believe stuff, I don't know about you, but you doubters, you're the real thinkers. Could I actually stand true on something and believe things and actually be a thinker? Like after it's all said and done, I've come to find that Jesus is my resting place. Jesus is my rock. Jesus is somebody I can hold to. Jesus is somebody that I can rest on. Does that make me dumber than the person that's constantly, I don't know. There's a phrase, you'll hear it, deconstruction. Well, some of you are like, you mean like on uh, Fixer Upper, Demo Day, you know, that sort of thing. That's easy stuff, by the way. Deconstructing, have you ever noticed that? Blowing things up, destroying things is, is fun, let's be honest. But w- the, the constructive work that goes on, that takes time, There are people today that elevate deconstructing. They'll look at the foundations of what the church has held to for years, and they go, yeah, that's great, but let's deconstruct that for a moment. Let's let's take that apart. I don't mind that, but at some point after the talk, could we put it together again and say this is something solid that we can believe in? And so I say all that to you that maybe next time when those things perk come up and you perk your ear and go, oh, that's what he was talking about. You may have had these things going on around you and you didn't, you didn't, because you're busy with life. I understand that. But maybe you go, that's what he was talking about. And a lot of times it takes uh, on a form that will surprise you. Well, let's work through this together because I think part of this, oh yeah, um, look at what Jesus, how he responds to doubt. Matthew 14, 31. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him. This is, this is the story where Peter has responded and he's, he's falling and he reaches out. And he says, oh, you a little faith, why did you doubt? And so he's not commending doubt. He's saying he understands that we doubt. Remember when even uh, John the Baptist's disciples were like questioning, even John the Baptist, he's in prison. He's like, what's going on? He started to doubt and stuff like that. And Jesus doesn't go, you know, that's okay. That's everything's cool with that. He commends John as being this great guy that God has done amazing work in and through. But he never says, that doubting stuff, I really think a lot of it. It's more, do you, do you hear what's been happening? Lame walk, blind see. The things that the Bible has said about me are true. So I say to you that um, why we're here today isn't just wasting time. And I'm grateful that you're here today. Why, you're, why we're here today isn't just so that we feel better about stuff. This is truth. Look at look with me at uh, Mark 11. First point. First point. He's calling. He's calling. Look at verse uh, 22. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. And so he's saying in a present tense verb, you need to continually have faith in God at all times. This is the key to your survival, this faith, this true faith in the true God. And Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is a, a verses that are dear to us. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. That we need to be people that trust the Lord. And, and it's needed for salvation, but it's also needed in our daily sanctifying walk. Now, but he stops here and he starts talking to them about prayer. Now, why do you think in the midst of this, he starts talking to them about prayer? I mean, all their lives, they've been, 
hearing about prayer. The Jews heard about it in the synagogues. They heard about it in uh, different places. But Jesus stops here, and he's, this is getting close. He's getting close to his death. His, is his last week on earth, and he's going to talk to them about prayer. you think by now they would have got it. But think about it for a second, practically speaking, with the disciples where they're at. If you had questions about God, you had questions about God, and you had Jesus nearby. He's always there. Would you go, man, I want to know more about God. You believe this is the God-man Jesus. You believe he's the Messiah. You believe these amazing things about him. And everything he says is amazing because he is amazing. You don't, I, I don't think prayer would be on high on your list because you go, I'll just ask him. He's here. I grab him. We're at the campfire, and I got a question about God. I grab him. He's right here. I ask, he'll, I ask him. He's here. Jesus knows that he's not always going to be there. He knows, what, he knows ultimately where he's heading. They don't. And so he's got to tell them how to get power in their lives. How are they going to be able to be having great things happen in and through them? And a key aspect to that is prayer. So some of you may be sitting there going, you know, man, I'm just not seeing um, strength in my life. I'm not seeing this. I'm not seeing that. How's your prayer life? This isn't guilt trip 101. I just stopped for a second. How is your personal prayer life? I know for me, when I'm not talking to the Lord on a regular basis, I, it's just a strained relationship. That's just me, okay? But that could be you too. And, um, I wanna, and sometimes it's hard to talk to him. I remember when you guys were, we were just singing at the beginning of the service here, he's a good father. When we were going through a difficult time in this past couple years, singing that song was work for me because I didn't feel like he was a good father, to be honest with you. I'm just being honest with you. But I sang it. There were some tears. I sang it because it was truth. I need to remind myself of that truth. But right now, you may be a place where praying is really difficult for you. But you know it's good. You know it's a good thing. Maybe you need to call a friend and say, remember when Moses was tired during that one war, that one battle? And you just sat down and he had somebody else lifting up his hands because he just couldn't hold up his hands anymore. He's just exhausted. Maybe you need to call out to a friend and say, I can't do this right now. I can't pray. But would you pray with me or for me or just because you know there's power in it. That's why you keep coming here. It's really cool. Verse 23. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. So in a world of dead religion, believers need to focus carefully on the word of God. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 21 18 through 22, because this is a parallel passage to the passage that we read. Remember, the Gospels have different vantage points with a camera. This is Matthew's vantage points. In the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry and seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, how did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered, truly, and so this is the context that we're looking at today. Truly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. So this mountain, he, he could have been on the Mount of Olives. And by the way, if you want to look up on your own, we're not going to look at these verses now, but if you want to look on your own, there are some times where mountains will be moved in future. There will be mountains that when Jesus comes back, the Bible says when he returns and lands on the Mount of Olives, he splits it in two. This would be a great thing to watch, guys. All right? But I want you to look at some of these verses on your own. Revelation six fourteen. You can look these things up. We, we believe the Bible's true. Revelation 6, 14. Isaiah 2, 2 and 3. 
Micah 4.1, Zechariah 14.4. So he's basically saying that these will happen literally, but for us to know, this will happen in the future literally, but for us to know that he also can move mountains. And you know, we use that phrase. I don't know if you've ever had that. My dad, if I got worked up about something, he goes, you know, you can make a mountain out of a molehill. Now, why do you say that? Because he saw I was passionate about something that in his mind didn't matter. At the time for me, it mattered. It was big. It was the, but to him, it's this little thing. He goes, you got a way of making this thing huge. You needed this pair of gym shoes, Mark? We could have got these. You, know, those, the, you want this? I'm, I'll give you this. Because I'm making a mountain out of a molehill in his mind. But there are times in our lives that there will be things in your life that look like a mountain. And I don't know what that is for you, it, but it's huge. It's like just to get to that. How am I going to get to that? And he's saying, do you trust me? And is it what I want? Is it what I want for you? Because there's times where that thing isn't what he wants for you. It could be the worst thing for you. Did you ever fall in love with somebody and you're like, later you go, you saw her at the reunion, you go, thank you, Jesus, I didn't marry her. <laughs> Wait a second, there were some women sh- staring at me at the reunion, going like this. No. Um. But at the time, that's just like the biggest deal. So he's, he's saying to you and to me, I want you to keep asking. Look at verse 24. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Keep believing. You need to talk to the Lord. And when you hear a verse like that, you go, this is for some people. You know how people name it and claim it. And if you just pray over it, and if I got this word and they'll say all that stuff and they'll just beat that drum. But there's other verses in the Bible that help us with this verse. James 4, 3. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. And so I could, if my, if my motives are wrong, if my passions are wrong, and I'm praying out the, just so you know, he's not going to answer that prayer because it doesn't line up with his will. But he's calling on us to pray, to talk to him, to get to know his heart. Keep believing. James 1, 5 through 7. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. And then lastly, there's a, there's a part of this verse that, or the part of this section about prayer that must keep in mind as we're going to the Lord in prayer. Look, look at this, verse 25. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. So you might be, man, I've been talking to God. I've been asking him for stuff. I've been, you know, and I think it's his will. But you got this attitude. You got this thing against somebody. I've just heard personally just some recent stories of people that have been freed of stuff because they forgave. Amen? I'm telling you, I, I, I've, seen, I've seen it. There's been times in my own life where I would just, every time I drove by this area, it reminded me of something. Or every time this thing, came, and, it remind, and I was like, mm. but I'm still praying. I'm praying. I'm spiritual, but I got this thing in my heart. And God says, I don't want that thing. Forgive. Forgive. Where does that find you today? Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind to one another. Boy, that's huge. Be kind to one another. Tenderhearted. Think about that word. Tenderhearted. Forgiving one another. As God in Christ forgave you. You want to pray? You want power in your prayer? Forgive. Forgive. Dead religion leans on itself. It doesn't talk to God, doesn't trust in God. 
and doesn't forgive. Well, let's keep going. A few more points. Point number two, he's coming. He's coming. So we're talked about prayer. And now we need to talk about the, th- the authority of the person behind this. The, the, he is our mediator between God and man, this, this God, man, Jesus. And so look at this verse uh, 27, the first part. And they came again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, so Jesus is now walking into the temple. He's making his way. This is crunch time. This is, this is the, the time where some serious things are going to happen. Uh, in sports, this is the time where we, it's the pregame stuff. And now he's walking into the stadium. And there's a big hype when it comes to sports. This is bigger than that. This is bigger than that. And he's walking into the temple. So he's coming. Point number three, he's confronted. Look at the second part of verse 27. The chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. You ever have that situation where you're going to go and meet somebody? You see somebody walk in and you make your way right to them. I don't know if you're that kind of person. I don't know if you hide from people, but these they've dealt with this God man. They don't know he's a God man. They don't think much of him. They've been used to things by their rules. Just Just a day earlier, he had cleaned house. Remember that? My house is, you have made it a den of thieves. My house is supposed to be a house of prayer. He's turning things over. Think about what he was able to get away with. And nobody's stopping him. Nobody's messing with him. But the next time he shows up in the temple, oh, here he is again. And so they make their way over. It's like Fife, Fife and Gomer and Goober, you know, just showing up. We're going to confront him, okay? The chief priests, by the way, were the temple rulers. These are the highest guys. The scribes were the biblical scholar, scholars. They studied, interpreted, and taught the traditions and laws. The elders were the religious and civil leaders. So all of them are making their way to Jesus. He's just, he's just walking in. And get the picture. They're, they're, this is their turf, their gang turf. That They've been used to having the rules, things going their way. And the last time they, he was there, he just upset everything. Because, by the way, here the funny part, it's actually his house, okay? But he's let them spend some time in it, okay? So they make their way to him. You combine these three groups up, and they made up the Sanhedrin. They were the elite religious rulers. They dominated religious life. They controlled the temple. They told people what they should believe. They were very powerful men. They came to Jesus, and they're questioning his authority. You see this? They came to him. Look at verse 28. And they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? They want to know his credentials. They want to discredit and embarrass him. Who gave you the authority to do what you've done? These leaders never they, we We didn't give it to you. You don't, you don't have our secret handshake. You don't, you don't have all the stuff that we... Who, who, who are you? And by the way, there will be times where you take a stand on something and there will be people that will tell you, who are you to tell me how to live? And you... and Man, if ever you look at me and you go, he must love confrontation. I hate it. I'm faking it, all right? If, if any part of it you think I like it, I don't like it. And none of the guys that are in leadership in our church, they're going, hey, every meeting, who can we confront this week? Though that is not a question that comes up, all right? <laughs> we are like, Lord, we love smooth sailing. But every now and then, there are times where we have to... T- and what's beautiful about the Bible... I know, you know, of course, the Bible is beautiful. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's rough. But one of the things that it says that's great is, if I got a problem with somebody, guess who has to talk to them? Moi. And if you got a problem with somebody, guess who's got to talk to somebody? You do. And that shows even the steps in Matthew 18, how to go about doing it. And I'm telling you, most church conflict would stop there 
if people did that. In a loving, speaking the truth in love, loving way. Instead of talking and things like that. By the way, there's nothing going on that I know about right now. Okay? In case you're like, I knew you timed this message. All right. There's nothing. And let's keep it that way. No. Um, but there will be times where there will be people that, who are you? I've had family members. Who are you? And by the way, they know stuff about me. They, they grew up with me. So I got a lot of baggage. Because if you knew me, I'm telling you, I've all told all of you, if we went in a time, time machine and went back in time, I'd punch me, all right? Just going, hey, you, hey, who's the old bald guy? <laughs> I'm going on my sheet machine to go to the future. You'll feel that for a while, all right? I, I just have that, okay? I know that. And so they could bring up stuff. Yeah, you did this and you did that. And they're right. But God. But we can't stop holding to truth, holding to what the standards of Scripture are based on the fact I can't say anything because I've got this. Well, then deal with that because he's called us to more. I know parents sometimes that won't confront their kids. Well, I did stuff. Yeah, and you learned from it and you stopped And so now they're going to him and they want to discredit him. Who are you? Who gave you the authority to say stuff to us? And by the way, when we speak as leaders, we got no authority in of ourselves. My education doesn't give me authority. My intellect, really, doesn't give me authority. Here's what gives me authority to speak into somebody's life. The word of God. I'm just an ambassador. I'm just sharing. And that as a parent... If you need to deal with a kid, you've got authority. The Word of God. Husbands and wives in your conversations, going in the Word of God, in grace and in speaking the truth in love. Instead of, oh, I don't want to say anything. Okay, you keep sweeping under a rug. You know how puffy that rug gets after a while? You're tripping over that mug, but oh, everything's fine at our house. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Oh, I'll never deal with it. Vacuum cleaner, baby. Hey. All right. Leaders never gave it to him. But the masses loved him. The masses loved him. And the leaders hated him. Look at verse uh, 29. Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these, two th- these things. So he's got two questions that he's been asked. And he goes, you know what? I'll answer your questions if you answer this one question for me. Pretty good deal. Verse 30. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And I like this. Answer me. I love that. That's like bold. Was the baptism of John... From heaven or from man. So he's actually answering their question. Even though the people may not pick it up. The leaders, they're smart. They know what they're doing. John's ministry was ultimately connected with Jesus' ministry. And they know that. John was calling people to repentance. He's pointing them to Christ. And then he demands them. He says, answer me. Look at verse 31. And they discussed it with one another saying, look at, look at the, if we say from heaven... He will say, why then did you not believe him? So they're talking it through because there's ramifications. If 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 it's a God thing, then why didn't you believe him? In verse 32, but shall shall we say from man? They were afraid of the people for they all held that John really was a prophet. And so if we say it's from men, then the crowds will be upset because they they really like John. And you see these leaders feared people. Let me ask you this morning, do you fear God or people? Do you fear family members more than you'd fear the Lord? There's times where you have to have hard talks. Hard talks. It's not always easy. I mean, you wish it was the Brady Bunch. You know, everybody sits down. Dad sits everybody down. It's all good. Okay, Greg. Yeah, get along with Marsha. Yeah, we're fine. But you know real life. You know what it's like. It's hard sometimes. (laughs) 
So, and this must have been hard for them. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. It's almost, uh, you think how hard that is to say sometimes. You ever have that? I know, I, I don't mind saying, I don't know. You ever met somebody that doesn't like to have that? They want to know. That's why I have Google. I want to know. I want to know certain things. Well, what, what, we'll, we'll be watching a show, and Kim will go, man, where have I seen that guy before? There's this amazing invention where I can just look it up. Oh, yeah, he was in Dick Van Dyke show, yeah. Okay, now we can sleep. It's all that important thing we know now, right? I like to know the answer. And these guys are really arrogant. They, they, people go, what do you, oh, God's this, blah, 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 blah. And so he asked them a question. They go, we, we, we don't, we do not know. That must have been hard for them to say. And look how he responds. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Don't you love it? If you won't answer me, then I won't answer you. And I don't answer to you. You see, I am the truth. I want you to take a look, took a look at the future things here that we're going to be looking at. Chapter 12. What he starts to do is he, start, he starts to deconstruct. But what he's not, he's not de- deconstructing scripture. He's deconstructing a false belief system. And the first thing is a parable that he deals with the Pharisees. He deals with all the leadership. And then he deals with the Pharisees. And then he deals with the Sadducees. And he deals with the scribes. And right, he's going right where they're at. And he's dealing with them. And this is what God does. This is what God does to you and me if we're willing to hear him. There will be times where, I, do you want the truth? Can you handle the truth? Because there's going to be times where he's going to start telling us the truth about us. And we look in the mirror and we go, oh, that's rough. But I'm telling you because I love you and I want the best for you. The Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes had many, hear me on this, many conversations with Jesus. Many. They talked a lot. But they, hear me, never came to Jesus to find out the truth. Think about that. Conversation after conversation after conversation. Loads of them. Not once did they come to him to hear the truth. How are we doing? Oh, by the way, Nicodemus did. John 3, Nicodemus did. And Jesus told him the truth. He said, you must be born again. And if you aren't born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. So when you and I come to Jesus, through prayer, through the word, he's going to tell us the truth. And the question I have for you this morning is, do you want it? Sometimes the truth is hard. Sometimes it's great. But for you, and it won't be just your truth, it will be the truth. Let's pray.